what are three things you can do in the next month to grow your podcast? How can you turn a podcast listener into a customer? And what are a podcast expert's single best tips for episode titles, show artwork, and using social media to promote your show? Well, you're about to find out. Welcome to the I Want to Know podcast. My guest today is Jeremy Enns. Jeremy is a podcast growth consultant, writer, and founder of Podcast Marketing Academy, where he helps underdog creators and challenger brands punch above their weight with scrappy yet sophisticated podcast growth strategies and step-by-step marketing playbooks. He's originally from the cold, barren Canadian prairies, but now lives in sunny Barcelona after eight years of full-time travel. So I guess he's winning at life. Hey, Jeremy, welcome to the show. Yeah, Josh, thanks so much for having me on. As a longtime fan of all all of your work, I am uh, very excited to talk all things podcasting with you today. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have you on here. And I was trying to think, Jeremy and I, I remember maybe it was about a year ago, I had gone through, I forget what you call it, but basically like your podcast audit. You still have that up? Where, Where can people get that? Yeah, that's at uh, podcastmarketingacademy.com slash audit. And it's a self-serve marketing assessment that you can answer 20 questions in two minutes and get a kind of point-by-point breakdown of where some of the the gaps are in your current marketing and where some of the strengths are. It was really good. And and I, I highly recommend people do that. And then Jeremy was nice enough to hop on a call with me and talk through some of it. And I remember being like, oh my God, this was, Jeremy knows a lot of stuff. I should listen to this guy. And so I'm really excited to now have you on and pull some of that stuff out of you and share it with my audience. So let me jump right into it. So the first thing, the first question I have for you is I, I want to start with your advice for two different hypothetical situations. So the first is, let's say someone's about to launch a podcast. I want to know what are the three things they can do that will most increase the show's chances of success. And then the second part of this, the second hypothetical is, let's say someone's been doing a show for a year, it's going okay, but they want to grow it. What are three things they can do in the next month to grow the show? So we're going to tackle both the newbie and the sort of existing person. So let's start with the newbie. Someone's launching a podcast. They want to make the most of the next month before they launch. What are three things that they should do? I think the first thing, this may or may not be in the month before you launch it, hopefully is a little bit before that. But I think Mm -hmm. getting clear on what is the purpose of the podcast in your business or creator ecosystem. And so I think a lot of times historically, podcasting was seen as an audience growth medium, which like it can work that way, but that's the outlier. And so the way I think about podcasting generally in terms of when we're talking about like success of your podcast, I always go in with any show I'm creating and typically for clients as well and saying, okay, if you are going to be creating on multiple platforms, podcasting is probably going to be your smallest audience almost always. And that's just because there's so much friction in getting somebody to click play on a podcast. And there's not a lot of great discovery out there already. And then also you just think about the amount of time that people have, like people can consume a hundred times, a thousand times more social media posts than they can podcasts just due to time constraints. And so if people listen to seven podcasts a week, that is seven different shows, that's seven hours, let's just say, you can follow thousands of people on social media. And so there's just more room in that context or in Mm -hmm. newsletters as well, where I subscribe to dozens of newsletters and I peruse through them when I have a chance, but maybe a bunch of them are one or two minute reads. And so they're just a lot more accessible. So I think adjusting your expectations around and, and getting clear on like, why am I doing the show and what does success look like? And so that's the first thing that you can help align your reality with your expectations. And Mm -hmm. the the kind of counterpart to that is that when you are thinking about your podcast in terms of a kind of audience relationship deepening medium, and maybe more of a sales enablement medium, that's going to change the way that you approach your show and the content that you create and who you're marketing it to. And so for me, the goal of, of whenever I'm creating a podcast is I want people to spend like literal hours with me. Like the metric I care more about is like, how many hours is each person who listens to the show spending with me? And this is, I, I did the, the math. So I have a automated email sequence. Basically all my newsletters, I write them to be evergreen. And so they just go into a, a sequence. And so somebody signs mm-hmm. up today, they're getting something I wrote two years ago. And in however many, a few months, they're going to get the stuff that I'm writing currently. And I added all that up and I set up my newsletter to be a kind of two minute per day, uh, week daily email. And I thought, okay, even if everybody goes through all like 125 issues, that's okay, 250 minutes, let's say, maybe a little bit more. But somebody listening to five podcast episodes already has by far surpassed that amount of time. And so I thought, uh, this is it. When we're thinking about driving sales with our content, I think that 
time spent with us is probably one of the best leading indicators of somebody who's going to become a customer. And you can just rack that up so much faster with podcasting. And so that's where, where I think about when I'm starting a podcast, I'm thinking like, okay, I'm probably going to get more top of funnel attention to social media, to my email newsletter, but the people who are going to become the buyers and the super fans, like it's always going to be a smaller number of people, but those are the people that's the point of the podcast is to really serve those people well. And so that's, that's my approach to starting podcasts. You can do it mm -hmm. the other way. I know there are people who like go out to create a hugely marketable show that has a lot of growth potential. That's one way to approach it, but I think that's uh, less likely for most people. So. I would say that kind of alignment is the first thing that I would just think about, just get clear on if we're talking mm -hmm. about successful podcast, what does that even mean for you? And then I think that the second thing here is really to, I would just spend 15 minutes, set a timer and think about three shows that you love and just break down. How did you come across it? What was it like when you came across that show, if you did a search for a topic and you ended up on this show, like what was it that drew you to this show? Was there something about the name, something about the cover art, something about the packaging of the show when you clicked in the description, the episode titles, like why out of all the shows that you came across what drew you into this one and then from there think about what keeps you coming back as a listener and this has been like the single most transformative marketing practice for me as somebody who was trained in marketing and was like an anti-marketing pure creative person historically the biggest thing that i did to get better at marketing was just every time i bought something clicked on a blog post subscribed to a podcast i just spent 30 seconds of thought what just happened here? What, why out of all the stuff I ignore every day, this is this extreme outlier that got me to actually take the action. Like, how did it do it? And you start to recognize your own biases and your own kind of inclinations. And you realize, oh, like it worked on me. Probably that works on other people. And then you can just start to reverse engineer that in your own market. And so examining the other podcasts, just do a quick kind of like rough and dirty scribble session in your notebook and think about, okay, the shows I keep coming back to, why is that? What are they doing? So that would be number two. And then the third thing that I would say would be to start before you actually create any content, this is kind of like pre-launching product or something like that, is actually just write the pitch for your show and start telling people about it. And so you can say, you know, your show name here is a podcast about your topic where in every episode we do this. And the, the goal is to come up with a sentence that people, it gets their eyes lighting up and they're like, oh. That sounds, that sounds really interesting. Like, where can I find that? And even better if they start pulling out their phone, they're like, where do I find that? And you're like, oh, actually it's not a real show yet, but I'm thinking about creating this. And so that's the kind of reaction that you want to be getting where you already know how you're going to market it. And you know that the language is landing before you start creating it. And so there's, there's been one of my clients recently, he's got this great show. It's about, he's a, he's a sound science professor. It's in the humanities mm -hmm. kind of communications department, but he has spent his life in a career studying sound, which is, I'm a sound nerd. I have a background in audio engineering, so I find it fascinating, but he's been working on a new show that is going to be more mass appeal rather than academic. And so he's been talking about this show where in every episode, we kind of like break down a ubiquitous sound that we hear every day, but we don't really understand the deeper story or meaning behind it. And he's going to talk with an expert in that field to break down what's actually going on here and uncovering some of those, uh, the stories behind the sounds there. And so similar to 20,000 Hertz, which is a popular show, but a little bit more in the analysis of the sound itself, which I think 20,000 Hertz uh, used to be a bit more in depth and has now become a little bit more surface level. So he's going somewhere in between that academic mm -hmm. and, and accessible. So that's been a show where like every time he brings it up in any call, everybody's just like, whoa, th this show sounds amazing. And you can just see everybody get excited. The show doesn't even exist yet. And it's, that's when you know, when you get that reaction, mm -hmm. you're like, okay, I'm onto something and now I just need to create. Cool. No, that I love I love all of that. And I wanna I wanna jump in and and dig in and highlight a couple of the things that you said there before we go to the the next hypothetical. I can't remember if you told me this or someone else, but when I was starting the podcast, I remember and this is not an exact quote, but I remember them essentially saying some version of look, if you're in terms of goals of your podcast, right? They're like, if you're starting this podcast thinking that it's gonna be this massive audience growth tool, probably not gonna happen. Yeah. Like a podcast isn't, not that it can't happen, but a podcast is not a great tool for growing your audience. But if you're using this podcast as a way to convert more of your audience to buyers, in my case of my skill sessions, of my coaching or consulting, it can really help you there. And you should focus on, you don't have to, but focus on that as the goal and structure the show accordingly. And, and again, I think at that point I had already had the show concept, but it's one of the reasons why my show with the exception of episodes like this is typically people asking me advice because it's a showcase for my expertise because I ultimately want them to buy products and services that are rooted on my expertise. 
having a show where I just bring on other experts is helpful. And that's why I do it occasionally to bring people like you who know things that, that I don't know. And also because I get to learn from them. But if that's all that I ever did, my ability to hopefully ask good questions and pull good information out of people does not make people want to hire me unless they're going to hire me as an interviewer, which is not a thing that I do. Right. So I have found that to be absolutely true. So what's interesting is my podcast is fine. I get lots of great feedback on it. People listen to it. I get a few thousand downloads a month, whatever it is. Like it's, I'm happy with it. It's successful. Do I think it's really grown my audience? Not really. Not the way my newsletter has or social media has or, or that kind of stuff. But when I have buyers, when people buy my skill sessions, when they would ever, the percentage of them that reference, I love your podcast. I heard you on your podcast is way higher. It way over indexes than the other stuff. So I found it to be completely true. And the other thing that it's made me realize now that I'm about two years, I think two years into, into my podcast, the other thing that it's made me realize is the metrics are really misleading. I don't know until people buy that they're listening to the podcast, right? I, so you see the download numbers and it's really easy to feel stagnant or feel like, I don't know if this is worth it or whatever. But then it's only after they buy that you realize, oh, wait a minute, that podcast was helping them buy, right? There's no way to know that until after the fact. And so now I'm starting to see the impact that that has. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. And so they're just looking at sort of download numbers and going, this isn't really working. I'm not getting anything out of this. And or if you don't ask people where they heard about you, if you don't ask people why they bought, you don't even know. They may not, they're not going to tell you like, oh, I bought. No, by the way, I listened to your podcast, right? But if you ask, you're going to learn, learn more of that. The second thing you said that I thought was really interesting that I, I love the comparison between time spent, mm -hmm. right? Attention spent on, let's say, a newsletter, which I love newsletters versus a podcast and how many issues of a newsletter versus a whatever. And I think the other thing that I want to point out there that it, that it made me think about is there's so much focus on getting regular listeners of your podcast. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it through this lens, it speaks to the power of getting people to listen to a single episode, yeah. right? That getting one hour of someone's attention, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's great for them to become a subscriber. It's great for them to listen regularly, whatever. But the truth is, if you have one episode that addresses one specific thing for one specific person. And you just, every person is, that listens to that is spending, let's say, an hour with you. That is the equivalent of reading a lot of newsletters. That is a different way to think about a podcast of maybe some of this is not always chasing recurring listeners, but it's chasing the right, I need to get this piece of content. I'm trying to get these people to spend one hour with me about this specific topic. And if I do, that's going to help me sell my product or get clients or whatever it is, which is just something I haven't really heard people talk about in yeah. that way, because I haven't heard it framed through the lens that you just put it in terms of attention, which I think is really interesting. And then the last thing I, I just wanted to echo that you said as well, your tip about go figure out like, why are you listening to the three that you're listening to? Spot on. It's one of the things I say to people, like the easiest way to become a better marketer is just pay attention to what you click and read and engage. If you just take a second and be like, whatever it is, right? Why did I click that ad? Why did I listen to that podcast? Why did I follow that person? Why did I subscribe to that newsletter? You will learn everything you need to know about how to market and promote your stuff. So really good tip. So let's, let's jump to the second of the hypotheticals, part two of question one here, which is, again, I think a lot of people find themselves in this situation. They launched the podcast. They've been doing it for a year. Maybe they've been doing it for two years. It's been relatively successful. They know people are listening to it, but they feel stuck. They feel plateaued. They're not quite sure. They're not going to abandon it, but they're not, they like to be getting more out of it. What are three things that they can do to jumpstart some growth from that point on? I would say it depends a little bit on how successful or how much traction you, you feel you have with the show. So I know lots of people who will podcast for a year or two or three, and they'll still be at a dozen downloads an episode. Maybe I don't know that many people, but there are, I, I do hear that quite commonly. Mm -hmm. And if you start reading through the, the podcasting subreddit, lots of stories like that. And then you go and you look at some of the shows and you realize why that is. And so they have never done any of that previous work that we started out with. And they also didn't get lucky in any way. And so they might've created a show that they're just like, I want to create this show, this exact show. And I'm not willing to budge on that. And people mm -hmm. should be interested in this. And that's not a great way to, to build anything that you want to grow an audience around. And so mm -hmm. if you're really struggling to gain listeners, I would say, go back to everything that we just talked about in the previous step, regardless of how long you've been doing it. 
But if you're at that 200 to 500 listeners an episode, maybe up to a thousand, something like that. And it's okay. There's, I am getting listeners and I'm getting good feedback. Maybe I even have some people saying, just, I listen to this every week. I love the show. And you're kind of like, well, some people are saying that, why, why don't I have more listeners? What am I doing wrong here? The things that I would start by tackling, which are usually the problem in this case, usually at this point, we're like, okay, I got traction. Now it's go get more exposure. That might be it. But I think a lot of times what I would double check on is a lot of the external kind of facing packaging. And so really starting with what is the cover art and title, really those two things like that is the, everybody is going to see one of those before they click into the show to listen to an episode in most cases. And a lot of times the title is not clear. And maybe even if it is, it's not, you can't read it on the cover art and the cover art might not look, I love our mutual friend, Jay Klaus coined this kind of phrase legitimate. And this was such a better word for me than professional, which I always use to describe like good looking cover art. But I think Jay spot on when he's talking about legitimacy is people are making this judgment when they see anything that is designed and they're saying, okay, this is what I have to go on. This is the information I have. And then they project that onto everything else. And so I've listened to many shows where the audio is great. Even the content is great, but the cover art looks like a, I don't want to say sketchy show necessarily, but it doesn't look like something that's going to be worth your time. And so somebody is not going to listen through 10 different shows to assess which one of these is the best. They're going to say, oh, this cover art looks the best. So I'm going to assume that this is the best show based on the information I have available. And so that's the one that's going to get my first click. And if it's just passable, probably they're just going to stick with that rather than going back and looking for something else, even though yours might be better. And so I think that's the first thing where we want to like, because this is a essentially a funnel where there's drop off at every stage, we want to make sure we're capturing as many people as possible who are getting their eyes on our title and cover art. We don't want to be losing people there at this very first stage of the kind of acquisition process. So thinking about packaging, design, cover art, your show description, ensuring that those are all like a kind of green lights all the way to somebody who comes across that who's a good fit for the show. They're not, they haven't been given any reason to like doubt the legitimacy of the show. So that would be the first thing that I would, would focus on and is often an issue. The second thing that I one step down from that is episode titling. And there's kind of two sides to this. And the first is that same kind of first time listener acquisition. They click into a show and they're looking for something that's relevant to them. And so if they scan through the first five episodes and they don't really see anything that grabs them, they might go click on another show rather than just scrolling back through the feed. And so we want to get some signals there that it's like clear what the, these episodes are about. There's something that is relevant to them, that speaks to them, that they're interested in. And so that for, for new listeners, that's part of it. And then on the other side of it, though, is existing listeners. And we, we talked a little bit about that on the previous section where there is a lot of value in getting somebody to listen to one episode, but obviously we'd all like people to, to listen to more. And I did a, an experiment with my show. It's called Podcast Marketing Trends Explained. And we actually, my co-host Justin and I broke down this experiment in one of our episodes, but I have about 9,000 people on my email list and they're all signed up to learn about podcast marketing. I have a podcast that's about podcast marketing, same topic. I promote it every week, twice a week to that 9,000 person email list. And we get about, when you break down between podcast and YouTube, maybe three to 500 views per episode. And so it's like a single digit percentage of the overall larger audience. This, the audience, they're podcasters. So they probably listen to podcasts. They are interested in podcast marketing. They get those. And these are two very different experiences. And so I was curious, what is the behavior that's going on here? Because I know that this is true for most shows. And so I did a survey to the email list and I said, hey, you're interested in this topic. I also do a podcast on this topic. Tell me about like, how often do you listen? And, and I asked a bunch of questions related to that. And it was like 10% or less people listen to basically every single episode, the majority of episodes, the largest group of people was actually, they were kind of dabblers, I, I called them. And so they would listen to maybe one episode a month. And so they, they really need to be won over by the episode topic. And so this both goes to titling, but also topic selection. And so I think a lot of times we think about increasing this external, like the, the most outer word ring of our audience is like getting in front of new people. That's the fastest way to grow our audience. But really the majority of people who've ever listened to your podcast, like they do come back every so often. And so the easiest way to grow the show is to get more of those people who listen once a month to listen twice a month or three times a month or four times a month, depending on how often you release. And because these are people you've already won them over on the idea of the show, but you just need to get better at enticing them to come back more frequently. And so topic selection and the framing of your episodes and like the actual structure of your episodes and then the titling, those are all things that people have a better experience and it becomes this thing where every time they're glad they listen, you're going to get more of those people and they're already, you've already won them over. They're already in your audience. And so that's the, the other part of episode titling. And that kind of leads into the third thing that I briefly mentioned there is I, I call these like the episode mechanics. And so 
I think a lot of times we take our cues from the shows we listen to. And most podcasts, I don't think are that great in terms of episode structure and format and pacing and interviews and like all these things, which like, that's, that's okay. I listen to plenty of shows that they're not, you know, great interviewers, but I want to hear about the topic and this is the best thing available. And it's not bad. It's just not exceptional. And I think that most of us have a lot of room to improve on the actual pacing and flow and structure of episodes. And there's a lot of things that you can do that aren't, you don't need to be study interviewing for 10 years and do a thousand interviews mm. to become a better interviewer. There's ways to map out the episodes before you even start recording. And a lot of it just comes down to clarity of what is interesting about this guest or this topic and what are, how can I really map out a structure to the episode beforehand so that I know you can build this narrative structure that like, okay, we're going to start here. We're going to end here. And that's going to lead to this thing, which is the really big reveal of this episode that I know people are, this is going to be the light bulb moment. So I want to work our way there. And that's something that very few shows do, but it's actually pretty easy to start to implement once you, you have, go in with that idea for mapping out ideas. Great. Good stuff. I had a few things that I thought of as you were talking about that. So the first is starting with sort of the, the show artwork and the quote unquote kind of legitimacy of it. I think the other reason why that's so important is that it speaks to the sort of commitment and caring of the person who's creating the show. It's not even necessarily about, yeah, it's great if it's really well designed and it looks professional or legitimate, whatever, but it's more so that there's that subtle cue of, well, is this show even going to be around? Does this person even care about it? And if you have sloppy or crappy or, and, and I say this as someone, not with my podcast, because I did have somebody design that, but with a lot of my other stuff, not a lot of images, not a lot of, I, I am someone who in general, I think a lot of my stuff, the packaging has not lived up to the quality of mm. the product or the content and it has hurt me. And I'm actually redesigning, I'm getting a new website design. I'm doing a lot of stuff now that all of that is, is going to change. And so I think this is true with podcasts as well, right? If your artwork doesn't feel like you cared enough to create, some, it doesn't have to be fancy, but to create something that looks, to use your word, legitimate, people pick up on that and they go, mm. I see it with newsletters all the time too, right? Where I'm like, this for this newsletter is not, this person is not really that committed to that newsletter. They, they, whatever it is, you can just, you can just tell, right? And so, and I think that people pick up on that and it definitely prevents them from, from checking it out. The other thing that I thought was interesting is, and you tell me, it may be my bubble or maybe you're in a, in a different universe where it's more common than, than it is for me. But I feel like episode titles when it comes to podcasts, obviously clearly important, but I don't hear people talking about and obsessing about them the way they do, let's say, YouTube titles. There is a whole industry around how do you title your YouTube video and people obsess over it like it's going to make or break the video, let alone thumbnails, which is a whole other thing. And in some cases, it will make or break your video, have a big impact. Podcasts, you could make the case because it's not even as thumbnail driven as something like YouTube. You can make the case that the episode title is even more important on a podcast than it is a YouTube video. And yet people don't think about it that way. And, and do you find that as well, that there's not the same level of sort of interest, thought, strategy being put behind podcast and episode titles, certainly compared to YouTube and probably as there should be? Yeah, 100%. That's my experience as well. And I think there's, there's two kind of reasons. I think the one is that YouTube is so algorithmically driven that you mm. just are forced to be more extreme and refine that skill. Like that, that is the game in, in YouTube is mm -hmm. to a large extent is like titling and thumbnails and obviously the ideas behind them and the video execution, but you're not going to get clicks, which feeds the algorithm. If you're not really working on that title and thumbnail podcasting is such a different platform because I feel like it's so much more for most shows, more show driven. It's much more like podcasting is a lot more in common with books than with YouTube, where you're in many cases signing up for what's on the front cover. And then mm -hmm. the episode titles do matter less if you have a strong overarching show premise. And so I think if you have a great show premise, the titles almost don't matter at all because the, mm. the premise is what people are coming for and lends context a lot of times to the episodes within it. That's not true for, for every show, but for many shows, that can be the case. And so that is, is one area where titles do matter less for podcasting, but I think it's still, that then means that you need to have a really, really tight, compelling, attractive show concept like we talked about in that first step where it's like when you give that pitch for the show to somebody, and they're just like, they don't care about the episode titles at that point. They're just like, this show sounds amazing. Like, where do I sign up? And they'll just listen to whatever the most recent episode is. So there is, I think, less of an emphasis. But I also think that mm. people should take their cues from YouTubers. And I think that that will naturally happen as 
more podcasters are also creating video versions of their shows and putting it up on YouTube. And then also Spotify is also becoming, introducing more of an algorithmic kind of recommendation feed into podcasting. And so I'm mm -hmm. currently collecting some data on that from my newsletter subscribers to try and see what is Spotify recommending and is there any correlation between episode titles or all these other things? And so there is starting to be some data on Spotify has impressions versus plays, which is that's the thing that we all have always lacked, but need in order yeah. to measure episode title right. effectiveness. The other thing I would say that you touched on as well that I think is interesting is one is obviously the importance of format. I think people underrate that big time. I also think especially the importance of a unique format yeah. is highly underrated. Mm -hmm. And I also like that you separated topic choice from title choice, because I think a lot of times what's happening is, especially with interview shows, right, where they're booking the guest and they're like, all right, we'll have our conversation and then we'll see what we talked about and I'll figure out a title that reflects it. As opposed to going, no, I want to do an episode that's about this. And yeah, this is the right person to talk about it. But I'm bringing that person on to talk about the topic, not just to have a conversation and then we'll figure out what the topic was after the fact. I think if people separate, which again, a lot of times they do with YouTube videos, right? They're like, I'm going to do a video about this topic and this is going to be the title. A lot of times they have the title before they even make it. Uh, I think you could bring some of that into the podcast world and it would probably be very helpful as well. So I want to jump to my second question for you here, or second, second scenario. There's a lot of advice out there about how to get more podcast listeners, but there's a lot less advice about how to convert listeners into buyers. So I wanted to talk to you a bit about that. And let's again, start with a hypothetical. So let's say I have a podcast that has 500 regular listeners and I want at least five of them to become my clients. Let's say I have an agency, I'm a coach, I'm a consultant, whatever. What are three things I can do to turn my listeners into buyers? Something's blocking them, right? It's not converting. So what, what can I do to improve that? Yeah, I think there's a few things that have actually, they have something to do with the podcast, but a lot of times like the podcast is actually fine. And there's, this is the nice thing about this is that there's a few small missing pieces and tweaks that you can do that will drastically improve sales. And so like the, the easiest one is actually just talk about your product more. And so I had one client, she signed up this was a couple of years ago for the live cohort version of my course that I, I was doing back then. And before the course even started, I looked at her, she had a show, maybe 2,000, 2,500 downloads an episode. She had a proven product. She had a funnel that worked and she never talked about the, the funnel or the webinar that led into, she knew that this converted at a fixed kind of rate and she never talked about it on the podcast. And I was like, what if we just recorded some ads here and got those in the episode as mid rolls and post rolls. And like within the, the first week or a day of signing up, she, she added these and she already got her first sale. And it was like, huh. So you had this captive pool of people who liked the show. They listen every day, but they didn't actually know that there was this next step that they could. I think she talked about the course. She didn't talk about the webinar that then led into the funnel for the course. And so I think that is a surprisingly common thing that I come across where people have got a great product, they got a great podcast, and it's just that this they haven't made this bridge between the two. And so I think that that's something that usually what I'll do is I'll put a post roll for if you have a high ticket product or something like that, that not everybody's going to buy. It's not relevant to your entire audience. I'll put that in the post roll. And so it's only people listening to the full episode. They're probably your biggest fans anyways. And that's just something that they will hear again and again and again and again over dozens or hundreds of episodes and will slowly convince themselves that, oh, this might be for me. And it's not going to happen immediately over the long haul. It will. So first thing is just product awareness. And if we think about the buyer's journey, like awareness is the first step there. And so we need to actually do everything that we can with the, the space that we have here, which is our, our show, to build that. So that would be one of the things and one of the easiest things a lot mm -hmm. of times. I think the second thing, apart from awareness of the, the actual product, and this goes back to, to this client, is making an easy next step and a like clear next step. And so for me, usually I heard of this from a coach that I've worked with. His name is Ross O'Loughlin, and he calls this a call magnet. And so we think about a lead magnet a lot of times. But what he's talking about here is starting the sales process by getting people on the phone. And it's not a sales call. It's just a discovery call. And so I set mine up and he sets his up in terms of a 15 minute kind of accelerator call or assessment mm -hmm. or something like that. And so the way I've set mine up right now from my newsletter is as a 15 minute rapid marketing assessment. And so it's kind of like, we'll get on the phone for 15 minutes and we'll break down, okay, where's your show at? What's your business or your, your creator ecosystem looking? And then let's diagnose some of the problems. And at the end of that call, if I'm feeling like, okay, there's a lot of stuff we could do here to, to tweak this, I'll say, hey, okay, 
I can certainly help with this. How does it sound if we book a longer call later this week or next week? We can talk through this. I'll, I'll share a little bit about how I work with people. This is still going to be, I want to give you some stuff that's going to be useful to you. And then usually on that call, they get curious. Like I provide value over the course of that 60 minute call. We dig deeper. And then by the end, they're asking like, so if I wanted to work with you, what does that look like? And then we can have that conversation. And so the first step is like having something that feels like the rapid podcast marketing assessment feels, oh, I'm going to get something quickly. It's only 15 minutes of my time. And that's making it easy for them to take that next step to enter a conversation. I think that that has proven for me just like a yeah, hundred times more effective than pointing people to a sales page. And I think we usually, most creators tend to shy away from sales. I am certainly in that camp as well. And so we want to do the automated thing. We want to point people to something where it's fully async. We don't have to actually have that conversation with people because we're uncomfortable selling and we don't know how to you know, handle that conversation. But I think that this, for me, the effectiveness, if I was trying to get five people, I would be like, okay, if I can get 10 phone calls, probably I can get five sales from this because I know my product mm -hmm. is good. I know who it's for. And so part of that is making that easy next step. And then the other part of that that goes along with that is having some like qualifications. And so being able to say, if you are this person in this circumstance, you're looking to do this, but you're struggling with this. It's okay. Now, now that that person's antenna is up and they're like, oh, I checked all the boxes. I should be paying attention to this. What is this? Then sign up for this call where chances are there's a few things that we could tweak that could help you get this result just by eliminating some of these bad habits. And they're like, oh, okay, I checked all the boxes and there might just be a few easy things that I could tweak that would get me this result. Yes, that is enough for me to overcome the discomfort of booking a call where there might be some chance that I'm going to be sold to. And I, I do that on the booking page. Say like, I'm not going to make you an offer on this call. There is no sales. You know, we're going to mm. show up and we're going to talk through this. And so don't be worried about that. And so that would be the kind of second piece that I would add there. So we've got awareness, then that easy next step. And then the third thing would be coordinating this with email. And so really thinking about podcasting, I would talk about this thing, but it's always, there's always going to be friction. People are doing other things. And so if you also have an email list that you can run this campaign and saying, Hey, coming up in October, I've got five slots to work with people. And there's uh, here's the, how to take the next step. If you want to start off, just do a, a rapid discovery call here, book that call. And uh, there's five slots and first come first serve. And so. Those would be the three things, coordinate with email, build awareness through the podcast, make that next step to actually engage in a conversation, whether that's face-to-face -face or over DMs or email. And that if you have a great offer, that should drastically increase your kind of conversion rate from a newsletter into customers. Cool. So let me add a couple of things and I have a couple of follow-up questions on that as well. So the first one is, do you know James Shramko? Yes. He's, yeah. So he's got, he's had a podcast forever, like online business coach. He's like a thousand some episodes. I don't, I God only knows, but I was talking to him and he said something that I thought was, was really smart about his podcast. So he sells coaching and mentorship and has a kind of membership program and his podcast is publicly available. Anyone can listen to it. It's free. It's whatever. But he said he makes the podcast for his paid clients. And what he means by that is all he cares about is that they like it and find it valuable because the other people who are not yet his paid clients, but are the people that will be, then they're going to find it valuable. And I thought, again, it goes back to that sort of audience growth versus conversion mindset where he's, I'm not doing this podcast to attract other random people. I know if my paid clients, if my paid members don't find an episode of my podcast valuable, then it's going to attract the wrong people anyway. And I thought that inside out approach was really, really smart. You know your buyers better than you're going to know other people anyway. So you should know what they want to know, what they want to learn, that kind of stuff. And just aiming for that is going to obviously attract more people like them. So that was one thing that I thought was really smart. One question I had for you is when you are promoting your product, your service, for that matter, even your newsletter or email list, what do you think about your, I'm guessing your answer to this may be both, but I'm curious to hear how you think about having set promo spots or ads, right? We're doing the podcast and now I'm going to do a sort of ad read for my product or whatever versus just integrating it into whatever conversation you're having, right? So if I wanted to promote my skill sessions, I could right now be saying, oh, we're talking about this. And by the way, I, I talk about this stuff in my skill sessions, go to joshspector.com slash sessions and check them out. Boom, boom, boom versus, okay, now we're going to have a sort of promo spot where I'm going to talk about this. How do you think about that? Is one better than the other? Do you do both? What do you think? Yeah, I go back and forth between this all the time. And so I don't know that I have a, a be all end all solution to this or answer right now in my newsletter, I have a like mid roll slot. We'll call it since we're talking about podcasting, but like, but in the breaking mm -hmm. up the content, there is an ad there. 
And I had that open for sponsors and I occasionally get sponsors, but usually I, I'm reserving it for myself. I think I especially like that because it also opens up cross promotion opportunities with other newsletter writers mm -hmm. and things like that. And so that was one of the reasons I actually started that was just to open up a slot that I could pitch that to other people. When it comes to actual sales of my product, where I've been recently thinking is I've, I've almost been thinking about removing it and just doing pure integration with a PS slot that like that is always going to be available mm -hmm. for something. And the one of the big unlocks for me was I, I've realized that over the past number of years, having done a lot of launches, written dozens or hundreds of sales emails, my sales emails have just adopted the form of my newsletter. And so this is great. It was a big weight off my shoulders where I always felt so mm. much pressure writing a sales email where somehow at some point in time, unintentionally, they shifted just to telling a story, teaching a lesson, but there's a more direct call to action than a typical newsletter. And so those have worked really well. And the other thing is you get way fewer unsubscribes where you're giving people value even if they don't sign up. And so that the effectiveness of those as sales emails then has me thinking like, well, if the point of my newsletter is to sell, maybe I should remove the ads from the middle and just integrate a next step into each and every newsletter that I write, because mm -hmm. it's all related to all the stuff that's that's covered in my program. And so that's where I'm starting to I'm going to start experimenting with that a bit more because I I still feel some hesitation about every newsletter being pure sales. And I mm -hmm. know many people like I, I know that many people with much bigger businesses than mine, like that's what they do. And I enjoy their newsletters. And in many cases, I bought their products. And so I'm kind of like, well, what's the hold up for me if I love their newsletters, and I buy their products, and I like the products, like, why wouldn't I do that myself? There's, there's still that internal kind of yeah. struggle with with how you want your newsletter to be perceived, I think by other people. But that is I think if you're gonna go, if you're optimizing 100% for sales, I would go integration rather than ads in between, I would probably remove the ads. Mm -hmm. But with podcasting, mm -hmm. I do, it just feels like a different medium. It's not people are not as likely to take action from a podcast and go click through the sales page and buy something. And so I do think that having mid rolls and post rolls for either your lead magnets or your products, I would typically do that in a podcast. And what about because obviously, if it comes to turning listeners into buyers, a big part of that is usually getting them on your email list first. Yeah. Any particular tips come to mind in terms besides stuff that we've already talked about? Anything come to mind that you've seen is particularly effective at getting listeners onto your email list in the first place? I know you have your uh, opinions about lead magnets, but I think that this is one yeah. of those areas where it is really helpful for getting podcast listeners off because there is so much friction. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you either have to have a really compelling newsletter concept where people can clearly hear they get something different and compelling from the newsletter that they're not getting through the podcast. So that can work. And so the, the newsletter can be its mm -hmm. own lead magnet, so to speak. Or you then do need to have something that is like an enticing thing. And so I personally, like we talked about at the start, I have this kind of automated assessment quiz. Those I find work mm -hmm. really well for people in educational kind of uh, shows and, and content where it, it feels like something that you naturally are not going to get from the podcast. It feels like this whole different experience that feels, oh, we're talking about this thing. And, and it gives you lots of opportunities to bring it up in context of the show. So in every episode, I could say, okay, well, this uh, episode, we're talking about the attraction component of my ears framework. And so if you want to test your attraction score, you can go to podcastmarketingacademy.com slash audit, and you can find out where, where you rank uh, here. And I could even pull up some examples from the episode. And so there's this way to like really organically bring it up. And I think those are great lead magnets if you can come up with something like that. And yeah. many people can. So th those I think work really well. The other thing that works well for podcasters are like private audio trainings. And so if you have a like private feed, that's mm -hmm. like a six episode mini course on something. Podcast listeners are, I think, more likely to sign up for that kind of lead magnet than a PDF or you know something along those lines. Yeah, good point. Cool. So let's get to my third and final question for you, which is actually a whole bunch of mini questions wrapped up into one. So this will be not rapid fire, but rapid ish fire. I'm going to give you a bunch of topics related to podcasts and podcast growth. And I want you to just give me your single best tip for each one. So let's start with picking a show format. What's your single best tip for picking a show format? I think the single tip version of this is to take your initial idea and push that further. And so I think a lot of times we adopt what we're surrounded with. And in a lot of cases, that leads to a very undifferentiated show. And so I would take that and you say, okay, I want to do an interview show. And maybe, maybe it's the best format for you. Maybe it's not. But you say, okay, well, then how do we go beyond that to 
for it to not just be like one more interview show on business or marketing or whatever. And so there has to be some additional kind of wrinkle in that format because just an interview show is not that interesting unless you're the only one covering your topic. And so there has to be some additional layer uh, that makes the format more interesting. And I'll, I'll give an example of this, which is the show. Actually, your show fits into this as well, but the show Three Books by Neil Pazricha. And so this mm -hmm. is a show that could be kind of like Tim Ferriss's show a little bit where he interviews top performers. But what Neil does is he interviews the world's top performers about their three most formative books. And so it's an interview show, but it has this structure that is meaningful and interesting. And we all know that we've had this experience if you're a reader that the books we read at certain points in your life end up shaping you and changing your life entirely. And so there's something interesting about that. And so rather than just saying what makes this interesting person interesting and successful, he's taking the specific lens to it by using books as a window into this person's life. And so that's an example of going one step yep. beyond that initial format that might have come to mind. Yeah, I love that. And it's funny. It reminds me of, and, and I'm going to, unfortunately, I can't remember all the specifics of this. So I'm going to give a fragment of a story. There is a guy whose name I cannot remember. I believe his first name was Simon. I forget his last name. He was the youngest writer ever on SNL's staff. So he started writing for Saturday Night Live really young. And then he eventually went on from there and he's written some movies and TV shows. He wrote a TV show, which again, I can't remember the name of, but the first season, Steve Buscemi played God, like kind of these like weird, absurdist comedy stuff. Yeah. One of the things that he talked about, he was talking about writing comedy. And he said that similar to you, he was like, you just take a little simple universal moment and amplify it a million times. Yeah. So I remember one of the things he had written, it was an indie movie or whatever it was, but he used the example of like, when you're in a relationship and you get dumped, it feels like the end of the world. So he wrote a movie that literally the world was going to end because this guy got dumped, yeah. right? And that amplification, so he would do, and, uh, and it's funny because I, when you go look and you look at the stuff that this guy does and even sketches he was writing for SNL, it was all that format, right? Yeah. He took this simple universal concept and was like, now I'm just going to build this story to amplify. And one of the things that he talked about was he said, because that's what it actually feels like to people. So like he used the example of the breakup. He goes, the way things make people feel both happy, sad, angry, whatever, are massively amplified. So he's like, when you create stories that reflect, it's not reality, but it's what reality feels like. And it was really, really interesting stuff. And just made me think about it when you were, we were talking about that tip. Cool. So the next one is give me your single best tip for show titles, not episode titles, but show titles. Yeah, this is a, a tough one because I think people want to get oftentimes very cute with their titles. And I think really great show titles, there is this element of like wordplay or something pleasing about it, but it doesn't sacrifice clarity. And so I always think about first and foremost is somebody who comes across the show, it should speak to them. It should, they should see that this is relevant to them. So that's like the number one thing that you want to satisfy. If nothing else, somebody who is scanning through their social feed or through a podcast app should catch this for half a second out of the corner of their eye and it should draw their attention and be like, oh, this is something that is worth a second look. And so that's where you think about what are the keywords that your people are already thinking about? They're already on their minds all the time. If you're you know, watching or listening to this show, probably it's something to do with creators or creativity or marketing or growth or audience, something like that. That's in your title. People who are already keyed up to look for those things, it doesn't mean they're going to click on it, but it does mean that it's going to get a second look from them. So that kind of like relevance, I think, is massively underrated mm -hmm. in all of marketing. And it's, it feels like such a low bar and yet so much content fails to actually yeah. meet. And then I think beyond that, thinking about like relevant and evocative. And so I think about this where you read the title and you might not know sometimes like exactly what the show is about based on the title, but other times you're like, oh, I think I can see where this is going. I can project based on the title what the show might be like. And that's enough to, to open that curiosity loop to get people to click in and, and read the description, look at the episode titles and learn more. Cool. And what about episode titles? What's your best tip for episode titles? So I have a, a framework that I use. I just stumbled upon this about a month or two ago. So I call it the SHARP framework for episode titles. And so it's making sure that your, your episode titles check these kind of five boxes here. And so it's uh, specific, hooky, aligned, relevant, and polished. And so specific, I think that to me, copywriting, like the majority of, of good copywriting is just being specific with your language. And so I think a lot of times people take this broad, super broad, I, I think of this as like a dull topic and not dull as in boring, but just as the opposite of sharp, where it just feels like there's nothing that is specific enough to get somebody to pay attention to it. And there's just so much content online that the more specific we can get with, again, this goes back to the topic selection, 
also the words that we're using in our titles, the more likely it is to pierce that bubble that we all have around us kind of protecting our attention. Mm -hmm. Hooky is makes sense. There's some hook to it. There's some kind of curiosity that it opens up where we want to know more. There's something that grabs us, makes us curious. Aligned or alignment, I think about this being about the title actually reflects what's in the episode. And so ideally, this is like the title leads into whatever the first bit of audio is, which leads into the first question. If you do an interview show, all of that is like the reason people will click play on an episode is because of the title. So we want to make sure that we actually get into that immediately because otherwise they're like, oh, I thought this is going to be about this. And I've listened to so mm. many episodes that take 30 minutes to get to what was promised in the title. And maybe it is, maybe you spend 20 minutes talking about that thing, 30 minutes into the episode but you've probably lost most of the people who actually wanted that thing mm -hmm. at the start. And so think about that alignment between title and intro and first question or like the first five minutes of the episode. And then relevant, we talked about again, when it comes to the, the show title, but just thinking about using words that your people are already keyed up subconsciously to look for and bring to their attention. And then polished is just like, it reads nicely. It's pleasing. It's like a title you read and it, it looks well structured from a grammatical standpoint. Uh, and maybe a copywriting or something like please, please about the title as well. So that's the, uh, the sharp framework. Yeah. I love that. And for whatever it's worth, one of the, the a title format that I've found has worked really well for me at least. And again, I think this is another thing where every audience and every show is different, right? But so for me, how to titles have worked really well, I mm -hmm. think, because it conveys that it's going to be actionable, it conveys that they're going to learn actually how to do something. It forces it to be specific, but especially within that how to title. When I've done how to fill in the blank with something that they want to do, and then in parentheses, counter the thing that holds them back, right? So like my a recent episode was all about email marketing, and it was how to drive sales with email and then parentheses without annoying people. And it's everybody wants to drive sales with email. Oh, he's going to tell me how to do that. And this is the reason why I don't like doing it because I don't want to annoy people. Oh, I don't, I can do it without that. Boom. Like I've done a lot of titles like that. I try to, at times I mix it up. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll try this. And every time I mix it up, it doesn't seem to perform as well yeah. as that format. So that, that's what's working for me at, at the moment. The next thing I'd love to get your take on, what is your single best tip for show artwork? Beyond, obviously we talked about having it be legitimate and professional looking, but anything else? Yeah, I think that thinking about it in the context of the title and the artwork as, as one piece a lot of times, where I'll often think about if the title is super clear what the show is, then the job of the artwork is to offer more information in terms of the vibe or the tone or, or something along those lines. Whereas the show title isn't super clear. If the title is more evocative, then you want to add more elements to the artwork that kind of grounds it in specifics. And so an evocative title, you might, might want to add imagery that people are like, oh, I can see, I get where the titles may be going. And then the cover art offers some imagery that's, oh, now I, I know for sure that it's in this niche or it's about this topic. Thinking once you already have the title, what's the work that still needs to be done or the ideas that need to be reinforced or seeded with the artwork. And, and that would be my kind of tip on that front. Cool. And I think I remember from when you guys were doing a lot of sort of audits of, of people's show stuff, it felt like another one of the themes that you guys touched on a lot was artwork that was way too crowded with stuff. Yeah like very simple, sort of clean, minimal, because a lot of times people are looking at tiny versions of this image and people have put a million, they're designing it as if it's like a big poster and that's not what people, it's not a billboard, right? Like they're looking at a tiny thumbnail. So yeah, and I've noticed that as well. Sometimes I'll see like show artwork. I'm like, I can't even see what's going on in that, what's <laughs> going on in that image. So the next one here, what's your single best tip for episode descriptions? So here I would focus almost all of your energy on the first or and second sentence. And so if you look in a lot of podcast players that the ones that do show the description, it's going to be truncated. So you're going to see one sentence or sometimes it's 10 words or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so that is the thing that people are going to see potentially at, that complements the title of the episode. And so thinking about, okay, we've got this episode title. How can I not just restate that or start by saying like, in this episode, Josh interviews so-and-so from this company. And then that gets mm -hmm. cut off and it's, well, that doesn't offer us anything new. And so instead we have whatever the episode title and, and then it speaks to the listener. And maybe it's something like, have you ever been in this situation and wondered about how to handle this problem? And, or it's maybe you had two options. What do you do here? And it's like, now we get into, okay, now I'm start grounded in what this episode is going to be. I understand the context of it and it's offered me something beyond what the title already has. Yeah, no, I like that. And I also wonder from a copy perspective, if it, you can almost think about it like a, a tagline, but not for a show tagline that you use every time, yeah. but a tagline for that episode title, right? Where when you see a typical tagline, like it's commenting on, it's not repeating what's in the headline or in the title, but yeah. it's commenting on it. 
and drawing you in a little further. The next one here, what is your single best tip for show intros? Because I know show intros a lot of times terrible. My own were terrible for a long time. Hopefully they're better now. And now each episode, the show intro is different. I'm not just saying the same thing every single time. But you tell me, that get single best tip for show intros. So my favorite way to start off episodes, I call these contextual hooks. And so it's the same thing that we talked about with the episode description. You can actually usually write, use the same kind of copy, write out a long version, include mm -hmm. part of it for your episode description. But I think about putting the listener in a scenario that they can relate to. And so this will depend on, on what your, your episode is, but we can get in a very short order, state what the stakes of the episode are and open up some like questions that they're going to have. And so maybe it's, we're just workshopping one with one of my community members this morning. She does an interior design podcast. And so the one that I was thinking about was like for an episode about how to not make the wrong decision when you're buying furniture. Let's say you're going to spend $2,000 on a new sofa. Like it's a big mm -hmm. buying decision. How do you get the right one? And so a great kind of contextual hook for the episode is you click play. And the first thing you hear is picture you're standing in the Ikea showroom and you're surrounded by $15,000 worth of couches. On your left, you've got this one. On your right, you've got this one. And in the center, you've got this one. You can describe those more vividly so that people can like, they're there and they're looking at them. And, it's, but, and as you sit there, you're wondering which one of these is going to be fit best in my living room. Do you opt for this one because of these features? Do you opt for this one because of these features? And what do you do if you pick the wrong one and whatever happens? There's like some negative consequence. And so like here we're, mm -hmm. we're 15 or 20 seconds in and the listener's placed in the scenario. And then you lead into, well, in today's episode, we're going to talk about a framework that will help you buy furniture with confidence to make sure that you never make the wrong decision and waste thousands of dollars on the next couch purchase or, or whatever it is. And we'll make, simplify your uh, interior design decisions forever. And it's okay. Now we've set up the scenario. We know where it's relevant to the person's life. It's something they can relate to, even if they haven't been in that exact scenario. And they're like, oh, I can see how this episode is going to help me. This is going to be juicy. Let's get into it. And so that is actually really, really simple. It's a four part yeah. like bullet point framework. What's okay. What's the, what's the circumstance, the context, what's the problem, what are the alternatives? And then what's the hint at what you're going to offer them, the, the outcome here. And you just list those in bullet point form and do a little like script, tying them together. And you can do that every single episode and it's going to really draw people in right off the bat. Yeah, that's great. And I would also imagine that if you do that before you record the episode, it ensures that you're recording an episode that's going to ultimately be valuable, right? If you do it after the episode and you struggle to do it, it means that your episode is probably not that good. Doing it in advance kind of gives you a guide point for, we want to make sure that we answer this. Yeah. And the somebody who does this really well, not in podcasts, but in newsletter is Caitlin Borgoyne in her Why We Buy newsletter. Yep. She opens up every newsletter with something just like that. Where it's, Imagine this, and then there's a scenario. Yeah, smart. What about using social media to promote your podcast? What is your best tip for using social to grow or promote a podcast? My best tip is probably not to worry too much about it. I think that at best, it's like an awareness tool where it's like people are going to filter down through that, but there's very little you can do to get somebody to take action from posting about your podcast on social media. So at best, I think about it, this is a way for me to make people aware that there is a podcast, that it does exist, but I typically treat social more as a way to connect with collaborators. And that's going to be the way that probably we're going to do some kind of like email newsletter swap, or maybe another podcast, or we're going to do a podcast ad swap or something like that, or a feed swap. And so to me, like that's actually the biggest wins in terms of podcast listeners that you're going to get from social media will be actually connecting with other people and then doing a more dedicated podcast driven, maybe collaboration in some way in the future. Yeah, I am not surprised you say that because one of the things that I have found is if you think about a sliding scale of podcast growth newbie versus podcast growth expert, the higher you get to the expert side, the less they think social media matters as it's cool. The, the newbies like the social media is how I'm going to grow my podcast to be huge. And the experts like, I don't even really think about it. It doesn't, it's not really a great growth tool for podcasts. So you're that, that lines up. The next one, any particular tool or tools that you want to highlight to that help make podcasting easier for people? Brilliant things that they maybe don't know about. I don't know if people don't know about it at this point, but uh, Descript or Descript, I don't know which pronunciation is correct, yeah. but I remember when they first came out years ago, I had a podcast agency at the time. I'm an audio engineer by trade, and I was so scared that, De that Descript was going to come for all of our jobs and the agency would be shut down. And uh, today I'm so happy it exists. I resisted it for so long. And now as a pure <laughs> creator who doesn't have the agency anymore, like I never open Pro Tools anymore or any kind of other advanced audio editing software. I think I actually gave up my license on Pro Tools, which is, is crazy. And now I just use Descript for everything and it is more than good enough. And like the transcription's great. I find it to be one of the more accurate ones, uh, better formatting on the transcripts as well. And then you can also build out tons of your social clips and stuff if you want to do that. 
So yeah, that descripts the one. I also use Cast Magic for a lot of kind of content repurposing. And I also use that for a lot of coaching calls, and things like that as well. Cool. Yeah, I use Descript as well and and love it. It's a great tool. All right. And then the last one here, just a wild card tip. Give me a killer tip on anything related to podcast growth, anything that you're like, oh, this is my best tip that, that we haven't covered. Yeah, I think the, the thing to think about is like podcasting is still the number one growth channel when you do surveys of how people discover podcasts is almost always word of mouth. And so it's it's often either one or two in surveys, but I've seen it a lot more show up as the number one growth channel. And so I think a lot of people leave word of mouth. They think it's either going to happen automatically or it's just impossible to do anything about. I think you actually can engineer word of mouth. And I think that a lot of that comes down to delivering a consistent experience that people can expect something each and every episode that the topics are going to change, but the format and the feeling and the takeaways are going to be consistent. And then also giving your listeners language to share the show. And so like in every episode, a lot of people have a standard show intro that they give. Use that 10 words or 12 words or whatever it is to give your listeners the language to tell their friends about the show and not leave that up to them. And so like clear titling, giving them the language, delivering a consistent experience, which starts with you knowing what am I trying to deliver people that they're going to get every single time they listen, they will get this takeaway or this outcome or this feeling. I think if you think about your own shows that you keep coming back to, you're going to recognize that I'm never, the shows that I don't come back to, I don't have a set expectation of what the experience is going to be when I click play. And so I'm hesitant because like when I go to click play in a certain circumstance, I'm looking for something that will satisfy this hole that I currently have. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what's going to fit into that slot there? And so, oh, I'm going to click this episode because I know I always get that. I want to be inspired. I'm going to click this show. I want to be educated on this topic. I'm going to click this show. And when we do try to do too many things with our shows, people don't know, they don't build that association with it. And so it makes it harder for them to come back and it makes it harder for them to recommend other people as well. Yeah, totally, totally agree. Jeremy, this was awesome. Thank you so much. I know people are going to get a ton of value out of this and want to know more and learn more from you. So let them know where can people find you, follow you, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the the best place is podcastmarketingacademy.com slash Josh. And I put together a page there with the podcast audit that I mentioned before. And so you can go through that. And it's a, just a two minute, 20 question quiz. And it'll highlight some of the potential pitfalls or roadblocks that are keeping you from more growth as well as some of the things that you're already doing well on. And then I've also got links to the newsletter and uh, my podcast there as well. So podcastmarketingacademy.com slash Josh. Awesome. For me, my newsletter for theinterested.com slash subscribe. My skill sessions, joshspector.com slash sessions. I'm on Twitter at jspector all the time and on LinkedIn. And by now everyone's already logged off because this is the part of the show where they, they log off. Jeremy, thank you so much. This was awesome. Everyone else that's listening and watching, I will see you again soon.